I'd like to welcome you to the National Fragile X Foundation's Let's Talk webinar series. I'm Jane Dixon Weber, the Director of Education and Support Services here at the Foundation. And before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to first thank Warren Global Conferencing. They're, they've made this webinar possible. A uh, couple housekeeping. We're, we, um, we're going to go through all the slides and then take questions. And use the chat box at the right side of your screen for the questions. And also use the chat box if you have any problems, if you can't hear or um, if you have any concerns. And we'll get those addressed right away. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Lori Yankowitz. Good evening, Dr. Yankowitz. Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. Hi. Dr. Yankowitz became interested in Fragile X back in 1992 when she heard a speaker talk about the learning and behavior profile, which described one of her program participants. She used some of the strategies the speaker recommended, and within weeks she saw major positive changes as a result. Since that time, she's completed her doctorate in education with a focus on intellectual disabilities and autism. And she uh, conducted her original dissertation on Fragile X Syndrome, mentored by Dr. Vicki Sethalter, with a grant from the Foundation. Lori has attended almost every international conference since her first one in Chicago, and she's become a well-known resource for her Fragile X community in New York City and in and, and the, and the area. Her resume includes more than 20 years of overseeing family support services for her families of school age and adult children with special needs. She's currently the Vice President for Individual Supports at HeartShare, Human Services of New York, the only agency in New York City with a contract to provide information and referral services about Fragile X. Once again, good evening. Dr. Yankowitz, if you want to take it away, we are ready to go. Okie doke. So here we go. I just want to say thanks so much for this opportunity. I know I'm in very honored company. You've had a fabulous series of Let's Talk webinars, and I'm really, really happy to be able to share information and make some suggestions that will help youngsters and young adults get prepared for the adult world. So I'm going to go through these slides as quickly as I can so that we can devote hopefully most of the hour to responding to questions from our listeners. Um, if there's any slide uh, that I go over too quickly or that you want me to elaborate on, please just let Jane know through the chat box, okay? All right, so um, in this presentation, I'm going to touch briefly on what we can do at school and at home to help youngsters get prepared for adulthood. And then I'm going to go into a little more detail on what happens after school or while you're transitioning to access supports and services from agencies. It's really important that you know that laws and regulations that guide service delivery for people with developmental disabilities is based on the premise that these adults, when they reach the age of majority, which is 18 in almost every state, is that they are expected to be treated with the same respect as adults who don't have intellectual disabilities. And this also means that they're considered to be legally responsible for themselves. This is as true for someone who is very mildly affected by Fragile X as it is for someone who is profoundly affected. So if you're concerned about being able to make legal decisions for your young adult or concerned that they may be held legally responsible for their behavior, you need to look into obtaining legal guardianship at least the year before they reach the age of majority. I am not an expert on legal guardianship. Um, it is an involved process. Uh, I encourage you, just if this is a concern, that you seek out assistance for this at the right time. Um, whether or not you choose to pursue guardianship, however, we as service providers are charged with the mission of supporting adults with developmental dis disabilities to be as independent and as participatory in community life as possible. So we have moved from a mindset of being protective uh, caretakers to one of empowering people to live as independently as possible. 
Um, your kids are going to be adults for three times as long as they are children. Uh, so we really need to use these developing years uh, to teach them the skills that they'll need when they're adults. Um, these are very precious years um, that are an investment in them being able to make some choices for themselves when they are adults. So um, some of these things, um, so in addition to academics, our kids often need very explicit lessons in activities of daily life, like dressing, eating, um, toothbrushing, traveling. They need to be encouraged to develop interests and preferences because they can lack initiative or the wherewithal or they can become too anxious to pursue new things on their own. Um, they're very capable of developing lots and lots of interests and doing amazing things, but they're not likely to do that without some support. Um, they need to really understand that money only comes out of ATM machines if you put money in the bank um, and that you get that money by working. Um, they need to learn how to solve problems and make decisions, and they need to learn how to get along with other people and they really need to learn to manage those upsets that they can be prone to without losing control. All of these skills that I just listed can be worked on at school and formulated into IEP goals, but because they're not academic goals, and they're not necessarily associated with the Common Core curriculum, you may have to advocate very strongly to have them included, and that is what I am encouraging you to do. Um, there's lots of things you can do at home to help your kid to grow up. Uh, as you go about the chores of daily life, include your fragile exer. Remind your growing child that as a young man or woman, they're expected to help with the running of the household. We know that most individuals with Fragile X like to help. It's one of their wonderful qualities. And we also know that they can be very good at self-care, um, much better than you might think, based on their IQs. So if you're looking at this slide and you're worrying about you know, the person who's cooking burning their fingers or soapy underwear in the laundry or the person changing the light bulb getting electrocuted, um, I'm going to say that's not a reason to not assign some responsibility. Um, it just means that we need to be thoughtful about taking safety precautions and also include how to be safe as part of the lessons. Um, there's lots of chores that a person with Fragile X can do at home that they most likely would really enjoy. Uh, a lot of it is heavy work, which we know is really helpful for organizing their nervous systems. Those are things like vacuuming, washing windows, sweeping, and taking out the trash. Actually, this afternoon when I was scrubbing the grill in my oven, um, I was thinking it would have been really great to have a nice, hyper-energetic guy with Fragile X to assign that short to. Um, I included in this slide a, uh, an icon of somebody regulating their water temperature. Um, I think that's a really important skill for people to learn. Uh, one thing that I know about working in the adult service world is that for people who live in supported living situations, often the only reason they don't have privacy in the bathroom when they need to take a shower or bath is that they have to depend on somebody else to regulate the water temperature so that it's not too cold or too hot. Um, I do think this is a skill that most people with Fragile X can learn if they're, um, if they're taught it um, with a lot of repetition and in a careful way. Uh, I also, there are also lots of opportunities to teach independence in the community. Uh, it's important for them to start taking responsibility for recognizing when it's time to get a haircut. Um, and not just rely on mom or dad. Um, you, they can uh, also be helped to learn to decide when is a good time to go to get the haircut, um, to 
learn to use the phone to make the appointment, um, to use a calendar to know when it's time for their annual visit to the doctor, or to help the family plan a social visit on the weekends. Uh, there's all kinds of tools for making appointments. I wanted to really stress that uh, if it's possible that you can use Skype for planning outings with friends or family, I think that can be especially successful. I know of a young man with Fragile X who um, wouldn't have a phone conversation with a friend on the telephone, but when his parents got him set up on Skype, he would spend hours Skyping and giggling in his room just like any other teenager, which was um, pretty thrilling and quite a, a milestone for that young man. Uh, if your youngster is verbal and can learn to use the telephone, Again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to teach them phone skills. This can be a huge ticket to dignity and freedom. Um, it can give them the ability to uh, navigate their communities, to try traveling independently. And then if they do get lost, they have a tool where they can call someone who they trust uh, and if they're taught to describe landmarks or if they have a smartphone and they can be taught to take a picture of where they are and you know, taught to find an address, um, then they're never going to be far away from help. Um, other things to teach in learning independence in the community would be stranger danger. Um, and it's a really good idea to see if you can have your teenager get comfortable with neighbors who you trust or storekeepers that you frequent. So if they get disoriented, there might be somebody nearby that they can ask for help as well. Uh, so Independence in the community includes being able to use public transportation, you know, if you're in a location where there is public transportation. I realize that some listeners might not be. But if you're in a city, um, and that's really the, the main way that people get around, uh, and if you expect for your son or daughter or sibling to be able to get a job, chances are they're going to need to be able to get to that job on their own. So when you go out and use public transportation as your child gets older, make each trip a lesson. Uh, have them put the coins in or use the transit card. Have them lead you to where you catch the bus. Um, have them look at landmarks as you travel on your route. Uh, make it their job to tell you when it's time to get off at the stop. Um, we know that our guys with Fragile X have excellent visual uh, skills, and they really can be put to good use when it's time to learn how to take public transportation. Uh, this slide is a list of some teaching techniques, so I'm not going to um, read each one, but there's going to be a PDF of the PowerPoint available to you, um, so you'll be able to print it out and review it on your own. Uh, but all these teaching tips are customized to the Fragile X learning style. And um, I wanted to refer you to a really wonderful resource on the Fragile X Foundation website. Um, there are some real life stories of accomplishments of some young people with Fragile X who are doing things like riding bicycles and cooking and winning sports medals. So. Um, it's good to know that it can be done. Um, I'm privileged to know a number of really wonderful parents who have um, empowered their youngsters to do lots of things on their own with their hearts in their mouths sometimes, but you know the outcomes have been incredibly successful. So now we've gotten to the part of the presentation where I'm going to talk about um, accessing services through agencies. Uh, the question being, what happens when your child turns 21 and they're no longer entitled to a public education? Um, so the answer is that it depends on the state you live in. A lot depends on you and how proactive you are. And 
that you need to know that services don't come in packages and that they're not mandated by law like school is. So if you don't access services for your adult child, nobody's got, the truancy officer is not going to show up at your door. Nobody's going to arrest you because you're not sending your child to an adult service program. Your young adult will be left to do nothing at home, and I'm sure that's not what anybody wants. Uh, so you need to learn a lot about what kind of services are available in your state and how to access them. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I have a link. Uh, it's a really great link that will take you to a page that lists the contact for the state office in every state that oversees services for people with developmental disabilities. And if you go to the link of your state and you do a little bit of research, you will find out uh, what specific services are offered um, in your particular state. So this is a sample of some of the kinds of supports available in California. Uh, and I highlighted a couple of them that I'm going to talk about a little more um, while I review the slides, and actually um, mainly two, which are respite and dehabilitation. And uh, those are very, very common services that I think are most likely available in pretty much every state in the country. So habilitation is a word that the adult service community is very familiar with. Um, schools educate children, but agencies habilitate adults. Um, habilitation is uh, a word that just means uh, teaching or training people to become as independent as possible. Um, so to have a um, quality life, you need to be meaningfully engaged. And um, that's what all the, the, a lot of the supports that are offered in the adult world are designed to do. Um, habilitation can take place in a variety of settings. Sometimes it can take place in the person's home. It can take place in the community. It can take place at a program that has walls. Um, it can take place at a program that doesn't have walls. Um, those are the kind of programs where groups meet at, say, a coffee shop and maybe they go to a volunteer site and then they go out for lunch and then they, maybe they go to another volunteer site or, um, or a work situation. Um, these services are all based on plans that identify goals um, to help the person achieve uh, acquiring certain skills that will help them to um, perhaps get a paid job or to volunteer in a setting that is something they would want to do. Um, the other service that I'll be talking a little more about is respite. Um, respite to services that's available for families of children as well as adults. I just think that by the time a child is an adult, it's more needed because you're probably more tired after raising your child into adulthood. And um, it's also, well, I'll talk a little later about um, the other ways that it's, it's good as well. Um, but I know that parents of younger children are often reluctant to make use of respite. Um, their kids are in school all day. They often want to spend time with them after school or in the evening. They don't always really trust other people to be looking after their little ones. Um, but as the kids get older, it's really important to try to not sh overly shelter them um, because it's, you know, we have to face that you're not going to be around for the rest of their lifetimes. So um, I want to tell you a little more about what habilitation is and what a habilitation specialist does. They teach a wide variety of skills that are needed for daily adult life, including things like shopping, menu planning, cooking, planning leisure activities, using the phone, uh, safety skills, travel skills. I'll let you read the rest. Um, because I already mentioned a lot of them in earlier slides. But these are all individualized to the needs of the person that they are working with. Um, most of these services, if you're wondering um, how these get paid for, are funded by Medicaid. Um, and they're accessed through enrollment in a service. It's not really a service. It's a funding source called Home and Community-Based Waiver Services. 
and it's often referred to in shorthand as the waiver. And I did do a quick look at a lot of the state links, and every state I looked at, Texas, Alaska, Florida, uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, every state um, ha offers services that are funded through the waiver. Um, back to respite, and then I'm going to go back to funding. Um, respite can take place in a lot of different settings as well. It can take place in your home, or it could take place in the community. It can happen on evenings or weekends. It can be one-to-one. -one. It can be group recreation. And there's also overnight respite, which sometimes can also, um, you know, if you're leaving for vacation and for whatever reason, you're not planning or, you know, it wouldn't be wise to take the person with you. Maybe they just really don't want to do what it is you're doing. Um, in some states, you can arrange for uh, an agency to provide a respite person to stay with the person in their own home. Um, or sometimes there are freestanding respite facilities. There are hotel respite. Um, really a wide range for you to look into. Um, do make use of it. Um, it's a good break for you. It's a good break for them. And it's a really good way to start a relationship with an agency, um, sometimes before you actually need the other services when they become an adult. Um, many agencies offer a wide range of services. And if you start out with respite, you may be more comfortable and learn to trust the, um, the personnel at the agency, or maybe you'll have occasion to talk with some of the senior administrators, and then be more comfortable accessing the more major services um, when the person is an adult, like day have or, um, or residential support. So um, this waiver that I mentioned before is an agreement between states and the federal government with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare. And actually, what the waiver waives um, are the constraints of what Medicaid usually funds. So Medicaid usually pays for basic health care for people who are of low income and people who have disabilities. Um, but for people with developmental disabilities, um, it also will fund things like habilitation and respite, um, and in some cases, uh, environmental um, accommodations um, and adaptive equipment. So what is waived is um, uh, the restriction of paying strictly for health care. Um, in recognizing that people with developmental disabilities need other kinds of long-term care supports. Each state negotiates its own agreement with the federal government about the arrangement and what kind of menu of services will be offered. And I th think what happens and why there's such a difference from one state to the next is that, you know, some states are more willing to invest more funds in services for people with developmental disabilities than others. So how do you access these services? How do you get enrolled? I'm going to say that uh, by the time the individual is 20, a year before they're going to age out of school, um, although you can start sooner, you must start this process because it is a long process. Um, a place to begin to get information is to talk with a transition coordinator at your child's school or with the social worker. Um, hopefully they will be familiar with what's required to be eligible for adult services um, in your state. Uh, you need to assess how much you trust that person's information. I have found that some people are extremely knowledgeable and other people um, not so much, and usually you can tell from the way that they communicate with you. Uh, if you are not getting a good feeling that they um, are confident of their information, and that can happen because sometimes the eligibility requirements are in flux. Um, really, I think the um, Another important thing to do is to contact the state agency that's responsible for the services. It's also a really good way to double check on the information that you're getting from the school. 
Um, and again, you, you'll, be, you'll have the link that will give you the contact information for the agencies that are in your state. Uh, a thing that um, I'm pretty sure all states have in common when you are looking to uh, enroll in the waiver is that you will need a new set of evaluations, uh, meaning a psychological evaluation, a psychosocial, and a medical. So the medical can be a routine physical examination from your doctor. Um, the psychosocial is a developmental history, but the psychological usually needs to be a very particular kind that includes uh, raw scores for IQ um, and an adaptive behavior scale. And the fact that your kid has fragile X syndrome, which is genetic, um, is not especially relevant in determining eligibility uh, for these services, believe it or not. Um, many states do require age of onset of the disability, and that's where a diagnosis of fragile X um, is, um, is helpful. But as far as their um, ability to function independently without support, they're still going to require a psychological evaluation regardless of, uh, of evidence of the syndrome. And unfortunately, the state usually requires evaluations that are different than what the school can provide. So you need to find out um, where, uh, who can provide these evaluations to you. Uh, often there are clinics um, that are associated with um, agencies that know exactly what it is the state is looking for as far as the kind of evaluations, and um, those are what you should be looking for. And if you contact your state agency, they should be able to give you referrals. Um, once you, um, you're working on eligibility, you also want to find out, well, what adult services are available? What kind of habilitation programs are there? Um, what kind of supported employment programs? Are some agencies better than others? Um, I really can't recommend strongly enough that you network with parents whose kids have already gone through that process, um, who may have visited different programs or tried a couple, um, because I don't think there's anything as valuable as word of mouth. But you can also get a listing of what's available, again, from your state agency who ref will refer you to a local office. Uh, so be prepared that this it's going to be a long process. It can take anywhere from three months to a year or longer. Um, it's often a very bureaucratic process, so it's really important that you keep a notebook, um, jot down the dates that you've spoken with people, um, their names, their job titles, the agency, and what you talked about, and then find out what's the next step and when can you expect it to happen. You might be told um, within 60 days, within 90 days, or they might say they can't tell you. Um, often these things are regulated with time frames, um, so it pays to do your homework, um, and you can usually find that out through using the internet and um, the, those state links about time frames for uh, processing the paperwork once it's submitted for a waiver enrollment. So. The first thing you're going to do is submit a packet to determine your child's eligibility for services from the adult service system. Once they've been determined to be eligible, that they meet the state definition for developmental disability, that's when you can first start applying for services with different agencies. Um, so applying for services with an agency can also um, be a process. Uh, it can involve visits to the program. It can, be, it can involve trial periods. You might find an agency that um, looks like a perfect fit for your um, uh, adult child, um, but they may not have any openings at the time that you need it. So uh, be aware that you want to have a backup plan, kind of like a safety school when your you know, other kid is applying for college. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you could be put on a wait list so that if there is an opening, um, you can always um, 
think about uh, having that individual transfer from one agency to another. Um, it's not, you know, you're able to access, diff you know, choice is definitely built into the system and you're not committing a lifetime with one agency if you accept um, an opportunity at an agency that isn't your first choice. Okay, so <clears throat> in school you get services like speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. These are not waiver-funded services. Um, they can be paid for by insurance and that can be Medicaid, but they would have to be prescribed by a physician with very particular justifications and you would need to go to a clinic or therapist that accepts Medicaid to uh, obtain those services. Um, they're not funded through the waiver. And finally, my last slide here is the link um, to the web page that has a listing of all the states in the United States with contact information for the agencies that oversee services. They all have different names like Division of Developmental Disabilities. One state has Senior and Disability Services. Um, but you can be, it, it's a really reliable link as far as I can tell. Once you get to your state agency, there'll be a phone number and there'll be an email address and that's where you can start uh, and find out. They'll probably tell you what local office you need to contact to further pursue accessing services. So I am now ready for questions. Well, Dr. Yankowitz, that was um, a great presentation. Um, one, the before as we we haven't gotten any questions in yet, but one comes to my huh. mind. Uh, so, so do you have? So I know that many states that when a child turns 21, there are wait lists, and mm -hmm. that at some that um, that there's really nothing available to families. Mm -hmm. I mean. What would you suggest for those families if, if, if there is a wait list, even for just the you know, habilitation services that you were talking about? Yeah. Well, you know, I get very dismayed when I hear this. I have heard this at conferences. I've been really spoiled uh, working in New York because uh, even though we're having our time here now um, <clears throat> with, the, with budget difficulties, um, services are, are really pretty available. So, um, and we don't really have a wait list, but if there is a wait list in somebody's state, two things come to mind. You know, one would be to work at um, hiring somebody to work with the person um, using private funds, you know, or doing a fundraiser, um, maybe contacting a former special ed teacher, um, or if somebody um, knows someone who runs a small business and would be willing to take on the person as an apprentice, um, people have, you know, maybe can find volunteer opportunities for the person on their own. Um, you know, I guess you have to take a where there's a will, there's a way attitude um, because you just don't want to have that person sitting at home with nothing to do. Um, while you're waiting. And um, actually two other things occur to me. You know, one is if you are on a wait list would be to check in periodically with whoever is the keeper of that wait list. Um, I would try and get really specific information like how many people are ahead of me on the wait list and then call periodically to see if the wait list is really moving. You know, does it really exist? And I do have to say that sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease um, for people who may um, have, you know, serious behavioral challenges or there's special stresses going on. Um, I would do some real advocacy with the people who are overseeing the services in the state. Uh, and you, you know, it's possible to be prioritized uh, due to certain factors. And then the last thing would be advocacy. I would spend, uh, you know, if, if I was stuck at home with my developmentally disabled adults, uh, you know, with a wait list, I would probably be visiting my local legislators on a weekly basis 
and saying, can we help you stuff envelopes? Uh, you know, my, my youngster really, you know, needs support and so do I. Um, and, um, you know, really get involved with, um, with advocacy to change that situation. Uh, good ideas. Um, so we did have a question come in. Uh, yeah. if, if a child has fragile X, but he does not have a diagnosis of intellectual disability, that is his IQ is above 70, I guess his or her IQ is above 70, are there any services available? And if so, how would these be obtained? Well, that's a really interesting question. <clears throat> I mean, you know, it, it's the kind of question I feel like I would want to have a dialogue with the asker because it would be what kind of supports are you thinking the person needs? Now, if the person has a diagnosis of autism um, or has autistic-like behaviors, which is certainly very possible while having a normal IQ, that would still uh, be able to, you'd be able to access services on the basis of an autism diagnosis um, because you don't have to have uh, you don't have to have an intellectual disability if you're diagnosed with autism to be considered having a developmental disability. Um, apart from that, I, the person I don't think would be, they just wouldn't be determined eligible to access services designed for people with developmental disabilities. Um, I don't think that means necessarily there's no supports available at all, but it would then depend on the really particular areas the person is needing support in, and there might be other uh, support systems, maybe the mental health system, if there are, you know, if the person has a mood disorder, because we know that can happen with Fragile X, um, that might be available. Okay, great. I know I've received the question, too, that you know, if my child mm -hmm. has a diagnosis of fragile X, does that automatically guarantee him or her services? Yeah. And I have to say, no, it doesn't. Exactly. Um, um, so another person asked, and you can tell me if you know the answer to this, it's what's the difference between a conservatorship and power of attorney? Oh, boy. <laughs> Not my area of expertise, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, re I really would be remiss to try and answer that question. I'm sorry. Well, and that's no worries. I, I can see that Andrew yeah. can say, I will try to um, see if I can find, we'll do a webinar with someone who yeah. can answer. That would be my goal for that. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the other thing that brought to mind, because you had a slide on what things parents can do at home to yeah. help their child prepare. Um, do you have any suggestions on what, the, what you can uh, maybe write into an IEP that the school will do or, you know, that we, we could ask the school to do? Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, so many of the things that are really listed at home, I mean, you know, obviously not necessarily domestic chores, but, I mean, some schools have model apartments and, uh, you know, give people practice in learning how to do uh, how to keep up an apartment, um, you know, travel training, um, social skills, um, um, you know, we know that guys with fragile X are, you know, have a lot of trouble with pragmatics, with um, conversations, so, you know, even having a, a, an exchange of three or more uh, on a daily basis. I mean, I would love to see, I mean, that's often a speech goal, but I'd like to see it as an IEP goal because it's so important to be able to converse with others um, in adult life and, you know, at the workplace um, or even when you're, you know, shopping and making a purchase that I think it's a really valid learning goal for a teacher in a classroom to work on with the person. Uh, you know, it could happen at the beginning or end of a, of a reading lesson or a writing lesson. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's no, 
it, it, it really, you know, the purpose of school is to help the child learn. Um, and while the focus is typically on academics, it is to prepare them for adult life. And that's what special education is about. So, I, you know, my recommendation to parents is to give a lot of thought to what are the most important skills they would like to see their child leave school with. You know, they know their kids best. I know they hear that a lot. And it's not always, it doesn't always feel like, <laughs> I think parents don't always feel like they're respected as the expert on their kid. Um, but I do think it's really true. And what parents are up against at IEP meetings you know, are the demands that are placed on school personnel. Uh, there really is not the time allotted to really honor the IDA law, um, where there's, you know, there's, the law is fantastic, but the practice is often uh, very lacking. And sometimes IEPs can seem very perfunctory and very cookie cutter. I'm working with a parent right now where, you know, I'm sorry to say that seems to be the case. And, you know, she's a terrific, strong advocate, and she didn't agree with the goals that were on the plan, but she was having a hard time suggesting goals. And I, I'm working on that right now. Um, so I might, you know, one of my colleagues here in New York City suggested that I might scrub some of the consults I've done um, to share some of the kinds of goals that end up being recommended um, based on my consultations. It's kind of hard to just throw things out there without talking about a particular person because it is meant to be individualized. Um, but I think I might work on that project. Does that sound like that would be useful actually, to you? It does, and, and I could actually work with you on that if you wanted. Oh, good. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, one yeah, thing definitely. I, um, so my son's 26, and so at, in our in our state, in our school district, um, I'm in the state of Colorado. Um, there is between 18 and 21, they call it the transition program. And mm -hmm. so I basically set up my own. You know, they, also, they have a place where children can go to a transition program to work on skills. I actually set up a program. And, and so in those three years, um, you know, I really set up the program that Ian was going to transition into when he turned 21 and left school so that, there, that the change from the day he left school to the next day was very, I mean, there wasn't much of a change. It was really seamless, yeah. Well, that's awesome. Th that worked I mean, well for us. Um, yeah. Did you, did, we, you, did you find, I mean, be, between you being a really excellent advocate and having a background, I imagine that you were able to do that. I mean, what, do you feel like your school district was also particularly flexible? No, they were in his case. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I did find a job. But I asked them to provide a job coach. Mm -hmm. and they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and so that worked out well. Now, you know, I'm looking at Barb's um, follow-up question. And, you know, in our 18 to 21 program, they do offer uh, opportunities for the children to try out different jobs. Now, that means, you know, I don't know if your um, child has an IEP, but for the kids who have IEPs in the 18 to 21 program, they try out jobs. Now, they do not guarantee a job when they turn No, they can't. Right, they can't. But they do have opportunities to try out different jobs. Yeah, no, that, that's wonderful and ideal. And I was really discouraged at this last consult that I did because uh, the parent, uh, you know, I, I think rightfully so, wanted to see her son, who's 19, um, be out in the community as much as possible and, you know, at volunteer sites. And when we asked about what kind of community activities were provided, you know, the answer was a weekly walk when the weather is good. And I was really surprised and they just insisted that it's a school and that it's a, it happens to be, it's a private school that's 
funded publicly, and I think because it's a private school, they decide what they will and won't offer. Public schools, I think, are require you know have more requirements to meet, and transition planning is expected to include vocational training, just as you described. Yes. Yes, I, it is, and I think parents yeah. expect. Um, yeah. So, in this follow-up question, she says her, you know, and and I know that this is challenging. Um, you know, her son does not. I think she said um, her child does not have autism. He's too high to be low and too low to be high. Yeah. Yeah. No, that is. I I I empathize. Um, you know, I. It's again the kind of situation. I mean, what I'd be if I mean, if no one else is asking questions, then we can continue to try and talk with Barb. What if, if in an ideal world, what kind of supports would she be looking for for her son? Right, and I'd say, what kind of jobs is her uh, child interested in? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and and you know, if uh, if you want to follow up, Barb, you can. I know I received an email about mm -hmm. two months ago from a, a grandfather, or, and he said, my grandson wants to work in a bakery, what should I do? <laughs> how, you know, how can I find a bakery who will hire my son? And so how, mm -hmm. would, you answer, how would you answer that? And then I, we can kind of discuss that. Well, I'd want, I'd, you know, there's a, there's a few different ways to go about that. Um, I mean, I'd want to know how old the son is. Um, I'm inclined to see if there's a supported employment program that he could access through waiver funding um, where the uh, program would seriously um, consider, you know, his, his son's interest in working in a bakery and then the staff of that program would make a big effort to find out what kind of skills does he need to work in a bakery and contact, you know, bake, you know, bakeries in the area to try and develop a volunteer or job opportunity for that individual. I mean, that's what supported employment programs are supposed to do. They're supposed to uh, develop job opportunities and match those job opportunities with the interests and aptitudes of the individual and help the person work on developing the skills they need for the job that they're interested in. So it's actually really terrific that um, the son has such a clear interest and it does seem like you know, it, working in a bakery can involve a lot of different things. It seems like there are, you know, things that somebody with Fragile X could definitely do. Um, I, I, you know, I would make friends with somebody who owns a bakery and ask them what kinds of skills are needed for somebody to work, maybe do an informational interview, see if I could arrange for some, you know, volunteer um, work for his grandson in a bakery, even if it just means sweeping or wiping down the windows. Uh, so he, they could get comfortable and familiar with what goes on at the bakery. They could be maybe a greeter, um, because we know our guys can be really, you know, fabulous at greeting people. Um, network. <laughs> um, you know, no, it, I, I, yeah. Well, I was going to say, those are all great ideas, because, because part of, um, I think, you know, in some cases when our, uh, when our kids go to work, that um, part of it's just building relationships. Yep. And, yep. Absolutely. And finding someone who welcomes your child in their bakery. I, you know, I just said, you know, go to the bakery. Go to your local bakery. Yeah. Get, get to know the person. Get to know the owner. That's right. Send. Let yeah. them know your son. For That's sure. Right. Yeah, for sure, sure. Since, you know, if his son is able to, uh, or grandson is able to actually, you know, make a purchase at the bakery independently, send him there every day to buy a roll, you know. And we know that, you know, so often, you know, these guys are such charmers. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many schools I've been to to do a consult, and, um, you know, I'm told that the individuals, like the mayor of the school, or everybody loves so-and-so, you know. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't some significant challenges as well, but, you know, when 
um, when their hyperarousal is being well managed and they're in an environment where their needs are understood, you know, way more often than not, you know, their good naturedness and humor and, you know, desire to please people and sensitivity to others, you know, are qualities that just win them friends everywhere. And people, you know, want them around. <laughs> so that's a huge asset for somebody looking for a job. Oh, oh, absolutely it is. Um, you know, I want to switch gears. I, I had another, um, uh, you know, another thought when you were talking about mm -hmm. strange, stranger danger, which yeah. I think, you know, back to how friendly our kids are. And, you yeah. know, they don't know a stranger. Um, I know our local police department does a stranger danger class once a year. It's mm -hmm. a six or seven week program. Are you familiar with any other programs like that across the country? I wish I were. It's something I hope I'll have a chance to research more. I mean, I know that there are stranger danger curriculums. I would think somebody could do an internet research and find some stranger danger material. Um, I would talk with my kids' school and ask them for help with that. Um, it's so, so important, and yeah, you know, I know that our guys with Fragile X, when they're not being incredibly shy, <laughs> can be incredibly friendly, and it's, it's, um, it's a challenging skill to teach. Um, I absolutely believe it can be taught. Um, I would look at video modeling, um, which we know from research is probably the most effective way to teach social skills, um, many different kinds of skills to people with developmental disabilities. I think it'd be really effective for Fragile X because of their visual strengths. Um, someone might need to get creative and create a video modeling stranger danger tape um, or use social stories. Um, I think that just um, just when you go for neighborhood walks, you could start with, um, do you know that person? So are they a friend or a stranger? You know, and just, just start with the distinct, you know, use photographs and mix in photographs of people they know with people they don't know. Take pictures of strangers on the street. Mix them in with photographs of relatives and um, make a game of it. How fast can you pick up all the pictures of people who are strangers? And put them in a pile. Okay, so which is your stranger pile? Which is your family and friend pile? If you were on the street, who would you give a big hello to? Who if, you know, I mean, I, I can think of lots and lots of ways to work with that, and you know, where you could do a practice really every day on first identifying a stranger from a friend, and then, you know, I don't think we want to teach our kids to know friendly, you know, and, you know, avoid strangers no matter what, but then you start talking about different scenarios, you know. So if this, if, if, if this person asked you to go in their car um, and they were going to give you, um, you know, something good to eat, would you go? You know, yeah. I mean, it's hard. Hypotheticals aren't always the greatest, but I think that, you know, you have to think creatively. You could do role plays at home, maybe with siblings, you know, make plays. Um, we know closure techniques are really great with Fragile X. So if you're walking down the street and a stranger approaches you and says, come with me, you, you know, and then the fill-in is, say hi and keep walking, you know, right. things like that. Well, and I know that my son would even, you know, has, is, you know, we're still working on that. And so when yeah. he walks home from work uh, a couple of days a week, and I've just said, you know, if someone offers you a ride, even if you know them, just say, just, I need yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need the yeah. exercise. Right. <laughs> I think that's good, Shane. <laughs> that makes it nice and simple. <laughs> And we'll keep them fit. <laughs> um, one other thing, if you, since we have just a couple more minutes, um, yeah. I know there are many parents applying for Medicaid when their child turns 18. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any, yep. any uh, 
words of wisdom with regards to that? Um, I think that's it's fine. I think it's a good idea. I think it's a, you know, as soon as they reach the age of majority, you know, their income won't be considered for Medicaid eligibility, and it's such a passport to services for adults that uh, it's a good thing to do. I do have words of wisdom, though, come to think of it, because not all Medicaid is created equal. Um, so when, when they go to apply for Medicaid, I highly recommend that they find, you know, often there are agencies that have specialists whose job it is to help people with developmental disabilities apply for Medicaid because you need the right code for the Medicaid to pay for some of the special services for people with developmental disabilities. So it, it's not it's not advisable to just go to any old Medicaid office and say, you know, my kid has a developmental disability and he just turned 18 and we want to apply for Medicaid. Um, sometimes the Medicaid workers in the offices are not that savvy or knowledgeable about all the different kinds of codes that there are, and then it can take a really long time to get the code corrected. So again, I would say those, um, the links to those state agencies that oversee services should be able to refer people if there's a resource local to them that can help with those Medicaid applications. But yeah, applying it, you know, the sooner the better. And let me add that children can access the Medicaid waiver. Um, even if their parents are earning a high income. So I had mentioned respite, for instance, in my slide presentation. Uh, there's after-school programs that are waiver-funded. If, uh, if you contact an agency, uh, if, you, if your child's already determined to be eligible, you know, you've gone through that um, level of care eligibility determination, and you identify an agency that has an appropriate service like respite or an after-school program, you can then apply for the waiver. The other thing the waiver waives is income requirements for a child who needs a waiver service. So I'm really glad you mentioned that because that might be really valuable information to somebody who's listening. Good one. Yes. Yeah. Um. You know, I was going to just uh, share one other story that actually that happened last week um, just for the, for the benefit of the other parents. Um, my son called me when he was at the end of his work day, and I noticed he was a little bit late calling me. And mm -hmm. one, of the, one, of his other, one of the other people who has a disability that he works with, who's also a bagger at our grocery store, she had a seizure. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. when I went down, the firefighters were down there, and they came up to me after the ambulance came and said, what kind of information does the store have on all the people with developmental disabilities who work here? And I said, I don't have any idea. And, and I said okay. to them, uh, if, if I put a little card in Ian's billfold that says who to contact in case of emergency, would you guys look there? And they both looked at me and said no. If we have mm -hmm. a person, for example, who has a seizure or who um, is uh, unable to respond, the first thing they look at is around their neck to see if they have necklace, like dog tags type of mm -hmm. thing, or if they're wearing a bracelet. And I said, what do you need to know? And they said, mm -hmm. we need to know if he's allergic to anything. And hmm. so um, I was going to um, make sure, I was going to put the word out on that, that, you know, mm -hmm. to, that it's interesting. I thought they would look in his billfold, but they, mm -hmm. they said the first thing they look at are for dog tags or some sort of bracelet to see if they're allergic. Huh, that's interesting. And of course, one thing that occurs to me is, okay, so if you're prone to seizures, that could be, of course, important for maybe an employer to know. Um, uh, so number one, they're not shocked. Number two, uh, somebody on the staff knows how to respond to somebody having a seizure because there's some pretty simple 
um, but important things to know to do. Um, but as far as information about people with developmental disabilities, you know, you asked a good question, because I don't know that anybody really has to necessarily know anything. No. Like the dog tags and the bracelet, I think of people who maybe are diabetics. <coughs> um, and I guess the allergy thing makes sense um, for the paramedics in terms of treatment. But I don't know what else, you know, an employer would need to know um, because, you know, the we don't want to be stigmatizing people either. Right. Well, and I know that there's, you know, confidentiality concerns and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I said, um, they said something like they'd want to know his, his age, if he's allergic, allergic to anything, and I said, and, um, you know, and, and, and as many of our children do, they, you know, he does take medications. And, mm -hmm. um, does your son would, know, does your, would your son be able to say what medications he takes? Would not. Um, can he learn? Can he learn to? Um, you know, I think that, you know, when I was speaking with the firefighters about it, they said um, w if we knew that he, uh, you know, what we would really need to know is does he take medications? And if he does, then we would, you know, like we would find a care provider, a caretaker, a parent, you know, our guardian, someone who could um, tell us more before we did anything. And so um, hmm. I, I'm not for sure. I, you know, I actually, I, no, you know what? I, I don't think I don't think my son could do that. You know, some kids probably could. I don't think my son could. But um, well, yeah. I mean, another thing might be. I mean, for in terms of um, supporting his maximal independence, so you, you know, you go to he goes for his routine physical exam. And, it, you know, if they take a history or, you know, they routinely will review what medications he takes. If if you could take the labels um, or copy down the information from his pill bottles and put them on an index card and then say, Ian, this is information about your medications that you can give to the doctor, you know, when they ask you about what medications you take, you know, that, that might make him feel a little more adult. You no, know, that's a good idea. He could do it. What he could do. Yeah, I, th I think the the more, I mean, like you said, you you really have to mm -hmm. think outside the box and mm -hmm. look for ways to educate. Yeah, continually educate your child. Um, yeah, which I want to encourage other parents too. You know, there's been so many times in high school where I and I can remember it happened to me. Well, you know, your son's in high school now. He may have learned all he's going to learn. And um, oh, that's a terrible thing for someone to say. And I just want you to know that that's not true. I mean, our kids... Yes, to right. Learn. Of course not. I, We're all lifelong learners, as far as I'm concerned. Yes, all lifelong learners. So... Um, yeah. Well... Yeah, and, act, and actually, even more, I know we're going over time now, but... Um, um, I think it's even more true for people with developmental disabilities because it takes them longer to learn. So, of course, they haven't learned all they're going to learn now that they're in high school. They just, they need more time than most. <laughs> so, they, you know, they're going to, you know, as long as they're presented with opportunities to keep learning, they can keep learning. And, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to add about, you know, the medication thing is that, you know, we know that expressive language is often um, more difficult than receptive language, and a lot of guys with fragile X, and you know, women too, I mean it generically, um, are understanding way, way more than they're able to express. And I think often they may be a lot more, and we know that they're sensitive and very aware of what's going on around them and in their environment. And they really may be, you know, way more sensitive to feeling dependent or being treated not as adult as they look, you know, or as others their age than they, you know, are able to express. So that's where I think looking for every opportunity to treat our adults as adults uh, can only be uh, strengthening their sense of self, their sense of dignity, and helping them feel better about themselves. Um, I think you're absolutely right. 
And I think on that note we should end because that's a yeah. beautiful, positive way to end. I love that. <laughs> okay. Um, thank, Sounds good. Thank, thank you for sharing um, all your expertise with us this evening. It's just been incredible. And, um, and I know that I took a lot of notes. And so I'll probably get back, you know, be getting back to you and asking for more information, and maybe we can write something up, and you can help me with our, the adult section on our website. You can help me. That, I would love to. Let's yeah, do I it. would love to. Be my honor. Okay, sounds good, Jane. Thank you, Dr. Yang. All right, my pleasure. Uh, my best to everybody who's been listening in. Feel free to contact me if you think I can be of help. All okay. right, great. Um, All right. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to let everyone know that we, we, we do have another webinar that's already been scheduled, and it will, um, it's going to be in April. Monday, April 13th, we have Brenda Finucan, who's going to talk on the genetics of Fragile X. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, we'd like to again thank Warren Global Conferencing for uh, conducting, hosting our webinar tonight. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to say good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, you can either email Dr. Yankowitz or email me. Have a good evening, everyone. Talk to you soon. All right. Good night. Good night.